<laughs> I only reveals this when boys likes you starts to get an ideas about girls likes of me. I know it's popular talking all about that the bigger a girl becomes in certain areas of her tops and bottoms, the littler our brains become. But <laughs> that ain't always the truth. Though sometimes I declare some of us like to act such that it is. Which is why I carry this small leather pouch in my lady's bag whenever I'm not too sure about the gentlemanly attentions about my present company. A good luck charm, you say? You could say that if you was one to go believe in luck. <laughs> I just believes in knowing what there is to knows. And when the time comes, how to rightly use what you knows. No, sir. What's in this here pouch used to belong to the toucher. Now, you never heard of him, and I don't think any of the men folk round here knew him, least not by what we called him as just the toucher. I was a slight lesser of age then, though my kin would say I was always more than pleasant to rest eyes upon. And I wasn't underdeveloped under the top of my head back then, neither. I won't deny I'm still developing in some of them other places, from the way I keep pushing through my clothes before I wears them out. <laughs> Anyways, when I was a little one, about 11, 12 years, I was still a mite older than my girlfriends, and I don't just mean by calendar reckoning. Even then, I was interested in more than dolls and dressing up freely and seeing how many wrapped sweets I could make disappear in a sitting. <laughs> Don't you laugh, but I actually desired to learn about things when I was small and truly enjoyed sitting near the elders and listening to them tell grown-up talk about grown-up matters. I figured they never gave me no mind, sitting so close to earshot. They probably figured I didn't understand most of the adult talk they were speaking. Well, some of it I did. Like discussing whether to bring that electricity stuff in on wires. But some I did. A few books and magazines I came across in the attics and sitting rooms helped me a little, but not always much. And what I was learning then in school wouldn't help a blind coal miner stumble. But, like I says, I did like to listen. I enjoyed trying to puzzle out them mysterious things we little ones wasn't even supposed to be interested in. Or to ever maybe understand them right off and then just refigure amongst ourselves if they meant anything to us. Anyhow, it was early one summer that the toucher came into our lives. That wasn't his real name. Of course not. If I tells you his Christian name, you may have heard of it. It being the same as some of his relations that still live about the next range. He was a real person. Mark for certain he was. And he'd come to this town to visit with these relatives of his. He was the quiet type, as you might have figured. And he didn't have to do nothing while he was here on accounts he was just supposed to be visiting. And none of us knew where he comes from or what he did while he was back there. Mayhaps. He had to come here because of things that had gone on before in his hometown. He didn't look like no coal digger's son, that's for certain. <laughs> but naturally, the grown-ups never told us a thing, one way or the other. And most of us just thought he was just another grown-up, kind of nice, kind of quiet. Like I says... It was only after Mary Louise Jennings got hurt by him that we started to call him by that name. I suppose hurt's not exactly the true and proper word, not seen as she was cut up or shot or run over or anything like that kind of hurt. But she came a-running to me near twilight that muggy June day with her eyes real red and puffy from crying out all her tears, and it was a long, long time before she was able to cry again after truth was, she'd been too afraid to go to her folks after it happened. And seeing how her and the other girls kind of looked to me to understand the things they didn't, she drew out for me the whole recurrence of the sorry events. I told her then what I figured had happened to her and calmed her into not worrying that certain things had been left untouched 
so she wouldn't have to go to Doc Fitchett or the pastor about anything unless she really wanted to. She was fair to mortified if she should tell her folks about what this man had done to her, but I warned her that the man, Toucher, would just go and plain deny the sorry event, and then might be fit to call Mary Louise a sassy, bald-faced liar, and worse things than that. I told her just to keep it to us girls and hope real, real hard that such a sad and sorry occurrence would not recur again. But you know that. Except for some finicky weather, things don't change all that much during the long, dry summer days up here along the holler. And I guess neither do the nights. Well, things stayed quiet for a few weeks afters. And we had some good times about swimming, camping, going to the Friday night dances. But you know, too, sometimes people don't always choose the chaperones too smartly. The toucher happened to be one of them that was overseeing the dance at the school. Me? <laughs> I was home with poison sumac rash I shouldn't have had the fair sense not to obtain in the first place. But anyhow, I, myself was not there to cause any kind of ruckus, like the toucher was. Leaving out the sad and grimy details, it then so happened that Deborah Ann Marples was chasing fireflies out back. So he went to chasing her when nobody was near about and caught her. Sidnerin the indecent condition her lacy Sunday best dress was in when she shows it to me the following. I know then that the toucher had pleased his hands and fingers a whole lot. His mouth, too, Deborah Ann said, who to this day can't let anyone kiss her there without first wanting to upchuck. Deborah Ann told me she'd fibbed a big raccoon come startled her, and she'd fallen down and spoiled her dress that way. And her folks believed this after whooping her good still for ruining her best clothing. Yet she knowed her family would be severely taken in and embarrassment if they had refigured the truth. And also cause grown-ups would like the toucher so much, who didn't know what he's really like, that they just might not believe the plain and clear truth either. She believed me, though, after I whispered about Mary Louise how she was also okay deep inside and there was nothing on the outside which would show she'd ever been touched like that. Again, it had to be our terrible secret. No fool grown-ups allowed. Now, of course, I was getting worried meanwhile having this kind of bad knowledge fill in my head and not having anyone to let off some of the pressures I was getting put on me. By then, I knowed what the toucher was doing was nothing right or natural. But I didn't know how I could tell anyone. Anyone who put a halt to his touching, any more of us, that is. And never mind believing our words against his. But he was hurting my friends. That was clear for certain. And I didn't like it at all. Him neither. So... We began to play together more and more often, in the manner that we didn't go round by ourselves alone as much like we used to have done. We never knew when the toucher would be round, seeing as he didn't have no job or missus or anything that tied him to being someplace for sure at any particular time. He could walk around anywheres, be out all hours, and was still always grown up spectacle, being as we also never saw him at Miss Olivia's sporting house or near any of the gin mills and minor saloons, while we was at the age when most folks still looked at us as little dolls, and not as girls slowly but surely blossoming into young women. So we didn't have to act overly responsible or timid tame either, and could wander about pretty much where we pleased without anybody worrying where we was or if we was out alone. So... When Abigail Carathews was out picking wildflowers for her mom's birthday, it was one of those times where she was by her lonesome. And when the toucher just happened to be trailing her for a while, all the way from the main road out to the fields on Old Man Carter's property, he had her out there in the tall grass for several hours. 
At least that's how long Abigail said it seemed like when I went to visit her house after not seeing her outside for a fair number of days. She had told her folks she'd gotten hold of a summer sickness, and since school was out anyways, they hadn't been too upset about her malingering in bed in case she was just making it up out of whole cloth, her being overnight unhealthy and all. None of us had had what they nowadays call a hygienic education then, and Abigail, she was plenty as scared of what had happened, but not as scared as she would have been if she understood what the toucher was probably truly after, but only found relief instead with us young'uns. As I says, the reading I sneaked on my own and the big ears I'd grow whenever the grown-ups thought they was alone taught me more about personal and intimate things than anybody I'd ever talked to or ever had explained to me. Personal things about girls and boys. So don't you think for a silvery moon minute I am unaware as why you asked me to walk out all this ways just because the band's taking a breather. <laughs> Well, we was all getting pretty bad frights by now, and it was decided to let every girl we knew in on what had really happened to Abigail and the others so that they could be on their guard against the toucher from now on. They all didn't understand right off what it even was they had to be afraid of. A couple of them thought the man was right fair-looking and kind of nice and truly didn't know what it was they were supposed to be scared of if they ever found themselves alone with him trouble there was. I didn't know enough about regular men folk to explain what they was like, never you mind a man who wasn't anywhere as regular in his womanly desires. Those who'd been touched now took to carrying a knives and razor shaving handles hawked from their kitchen drawers and their daddy's dressing tables. Most of the other girls in town did too, seeing how four of us was aware of what was going on, and we all couldn't be capable of making up such a vulgar and terrible tale if some parts of it was not near to true. And we had to tell them the toucher never went back to the same girl twice. So it wasn't those who had been touched who had to worry, but those who hadn't. That whole summer, our kinfolk never noticed no changes in any of us. But that's the way it is with grown-ups who just about know your living existence till you do something they don't wish to see or hear tell about. But we was afraid. We purely was. And we carried sharp things in our ladies' bags and in our pants and dress pockets. Things that could hurt back if somebody came too close with their touching. And we didn't play much out of doors any time, though we had several weeks of playing out of doors weather still owed to us. My daddy had been working on the porch of our house during that same time. This is before he got sent overseas to fight. And he'd sent me into town to pick up a carton of newfangled roof nails he'd ordered. I could have took my bike, but one of the tires was newly flat, and I hadn't gotten around to fixing it even though I knew how. So when my daddy sent me on the errand, my own two sore feet was the main source of portation getting there. Our town has not grown all that much since these events took place, so you don't have to strain your brain too far to imagine how quiet things can get when it's too hot for anyone but a young miss to be doing business downtown. When everyone else is inside drinking cold beer or catching an extra twenty winks. I remember it seemed more like a Sunday morning than a Saturday afternoon, is how still and quiet and peaceful was everything. Anyways, the toucher must have been watching before I entered the hardware store, and knowed I would then cut through the back alleyway as a shorter route back to Main Road and home. Cause he's standing there, big as life like they says in their magazines. His shy smile and rattlesnake hands ready for me just as I reached the deserted lot behind the store. I never seen him so close up before. And at first look, he weren't nothing scary to look at. Truth to tell, you look a little like him yourself in this moonlight. But anyways, I knew this man truly. 
and I was remembering what he'd done to my friends. So I wasn't going to be fooled or sweet-talked into letting him get me on the ground so he could do whatever he wanted to my untouched person. But I had the carton of long nails, which was heavy, but not that heavy, sitting inside the paper bag. I don't recollect what told me to do this, but when the toucher started to bend down and reach for me with those long, fingery hands, I swung that bag of sharp tail nails as fierce as I could against his face. He went down to the dirt hard, without uttering a word. I wasn't sure if I knocked him proper or just stunned him like. So before he could get to his feet again, I swung that bag of nails a few more times against the back of his skull just to make for sure. The carton inside had broken open by now. And with the bare nails sticking out all wet and drippy stained, the bag felt lighter somehow by the time I was done. So, that was the last and final occasion the toucher ever bothered any of us. And being it was some summer's back, you probably had yet to move here to nose about the big hush-hush scandal and about all the questions that went unanswered. Unanswered for the grown-ups, that is, who never suspected any of us when it was finally over. Suspect of what? <laughs> you still want to know? You see... We each got something to remember the toucher by. Me and those I got together quick and gathered in that deserted back lot while he was still breathing. We didn't bury him alive, if that's what you're thinking. None of us are like that, and you're more the fool to think such an evil thought if you do. But, like I says, we all got things from him to remember what he'd done to us before he was finally put away by the grown-ups. Which is why I carry this pouch when I foresee my bows might try something a few beats too fast for my maiden heart. Take a look inside. Don't be skittish. Tain't nothing you never seen before. <laughs> this is one of the things he touched us with that dark, long-ago summer. You see now? He ain't gonna be touching any girls anywhere with what we let him retain. I got the biggest part cause of me being the only one who knew what counted the most. I forget as if all the others kept theirs. But last time I gossiped with Mary Louise, she still had his left thumb. <laughs> and Deborah Ann, his tongue. <laughs>